All right, thank you very much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Derek Parker. Um, and first, I would just like to start off by thanking the organizers for allowing me to present this talk here and for everybody in the audience, uh, in person and virtual, for checking this talk out. It's something that I'm very excited about. Uh, so as mentioned, the title of this talk is Debuggers and eBPF, Bringing Debugging to Production. So as you might be able to tell just from the title, we're entering into uh, something a little bit different than <laughs> most of the talks that we've had so far around networking and security and things like that. So um, the, the bulk of this talk is going to be centered around my personal experience uh, rewriting uh, the Delve debugger tracing backend um, using eBPF. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, Delve is a, is a debugger for the Go programming language, and it has a trace subcommand. So if you think of something like strace or something like that, it's somewhat similar, except for in this case, we're kind of talking about user space tracing. So if you want to take and kind of spy on your programs and see what they're doing in real time without dropping into a full interactive debug session, this is a way to do that. And I say bringing debugging to production because typically when you think about debuggers, you think about kind of like a slow, methodical, back and forth kind of conversation that you're having with your program where you're asking it a bunch of questions, you expect some sort of responses, and hopefully you figure out what's going on. Um, but what I want to talk about today specifically is more spying on your program. Um, just kind of seeing what it's doing under the hood from a user space perspective, um, the actual functions that you've written, um, and doing that in a way that's, that's performant so that maybe you can actually spy on your, your software that's running in, in production. So we've already done a little bit of introductions, but again, my name is Derek Parker. Um, I'm a so senior software engineer at Red Hat, uh, where I work on Upstream Go, and I also work on Delve as well. Um, so this being kind of my experience uh, using this with the Delve debugger, some of this stuff might be a little bit uh, Go-centric, but the bulk of it is about how uh, the tool uses eBPF. So there's going to be a lot of uh, talking about U probes, U rep probes, all that fun stuff, and especially how we can coordinate and communicate between a user space program, i.e. the debugger, and the eBPF program that's running in kernel space. So first off, why, right? The, the, the essential question that you have to ask with any of this stuff is, is why. I mentioned initially that I'm rewriting the implementation, so the implementation is already there. Why, why am I spending time on this? We have ptrace, and if you're not familiar with ptrace, I'll explain in a little bit, but you already have, we already have an existing solution. Shouldn't, shouldn't that be enough? Let's take a little bit of a digression. So if you're not explicitly familiar with ptrace, I'll, I'll talk about it just for a second. Essentially, it's process trace. Um, it's a feature of a lot of Unixy systems. There's parallels on other non-Unixy systems as well. Um, but it, it essentially provides a means for a user space program to take over, inspect, control another user space program. It's basically how debuggers work underneath the hood. However, there's a problem with it. Uh, Ptrace is pretty slow. And I mentioned Ptrace specifically in this talk, but syscalls are slow is really what it comes down to at the end of the day. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of dig into why that, that is so problematic for us. But ptrace and, and syscalls kind of in general are slow. They're, they're very slow. Um, so I, when I was initially starting to work on this implementation, I, I did a little bit of testing um, and some measuring. And I, I wrote just kind of like a small example toy program, measured how long it took to execute, and then measured how long it took to execute uh, with different kinds of tracing impl implementations on top of it. So as you can see, the program execution just by itself is around 23 microseconds. We're talking microseconds, not milliseconds. We're talking like extremely, extremely quick. So with the eBPF-based tracer, you can see it balloons up a decent amount. So we go from 23 to about 683. But, but still, remember, we're talking about microseconds. <laughs> like this is, this is not, this is, you know, a, a decent amount of overhead, but nothing too crazy. Then we look at the traditional based, the, the tr traditional approach of ptrace based tracing, and we go all the way up to 2.3 seconds. Now, for a program that executes in that small amount of time, ballooning up several, several orders of magnitude of overhead would never be viable in production. 
So this is kind of the basis for this work, is how can we bring this kind of user space tracing a little bit more interactive and ask these kind of questions to a process that's potentially running in production in, in a Kubernetes cluster or somewhere else. So let's talk a little bit about why Ptrace is so slow. Essentially, what it comes down to is the syscall overhead. The user space and kernel context switching gets very, very expensive, especially when you have to do uh, those kinds of operations multiple times per trace. So say, for example, you're tracing the, the, the entry point and the ex exit point of a function. When you hit the entry point, you want to get the arguments to the function and things like that. That could potentially be you know, uh, a single ptrace call for every argument. And then if you want to follow pointers, now you have even more uh, ptrace calls and you're inspecting more things. So this kind of can balloon out of control really quickly and get a lot of overhead. Um, and, and additionally, if you want to do uh, inputs and exits, that's two stops. You're stopping at wh where the function starts and where the function returns, and you're doing potentially multiple ptrace events within that. So overall, there's just a lot of overhead. So our solution to this is, let's use EPPF. Why do we have to do any of this context switching? Can we, we can do better. The, the technology is there. <laughs> um, so eBPF turns out to be very fast. Again, when, when we look at the benchmarking, there is still some overhead there, but, but in terms of, of uh, the other solutions that we have right now, it's, it's pretty negligible. Um, so let's dig into a little bit about why eBPF is so fast. First, it runs in the kernel, right? So there's no context switching. We get rid of that overhead just right off, uh, right out of the gate. And uh, on top of that, eBPF programs are, are typically small targeted programs. So the execution of those programs happens very quickly. Um, so we're not kind of running in huge loops and, and unconstrained uh, kind of behavior. And that single program, that single stop can, can uh, by itself gather all of the data that we need and send it back to user space without doing multiple points of context switching. So let's talk about the requirements that we had for our tracing backend, because I think this is where it gets the most interesting, um, in my opinion. So one of the things that we wanted to, to do, uh, one of the requirements was essentially it, had, it has to maintain parity with the existing uh, tracing implementation, right? So we need to be able to trace arbitrary functions. That's very interesting to me because a lot of the use cases for eBPF programs are usually very small and targeted. You kind of already know what syscall you're going to be attaching to or what thing you're going to be inspecting. Um, so it's, it, there's not a lot of guesswork there. You, you can kind of build in a lot of the logic just within your program. Um, we, for, for, uh, for Go programs and in the context of Delve, we need to be able to retrieve the Go routine ID. So we need to know where to find it and all that stuff. We need to be able to read function input arguments, and we need to be able to read function return arguments. So let's talk a little bit about tracing arbitrary functions. So in general, in order to make this stuff work, we use libbpf and libbpf go. So we've heard about libbpf, um, and for uh, anybody trying to experiment with eBPF stuff in Go, there's, there's a bunch of different frameworks, but um, we've decided to go the route of using libbpf go. It's worked out very well for us so far. Um, so we load the eBPF program, and that's embedded in the Delve binary. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but that, that has some interesting uh, side effects. So we attach U probes and U rep probes for each symbol. Now, this all seems pretty standard, but in the context of Go, I'll explain a little bit how U rep probes can be particularly tricky. So initially, we, uh, we embed the eBPF object in the Delve binary. This is something that I think is really cool. It's a feature of the Go programming language in general. Um, but it allows us to basically continue to ship Delve as a single binary without any kind of dependencies on disk or anything like that um, in terms of trying to find where this uh, eBPF program is or anything like that. Um, and, then, and then from there, we, you know, pretty standard stuff. We, we, uh, we, load, it, we load the eBPF program um, into, into the kernel and kind of hold on to some references from, from it. Now we have, our, we have our eBPF program, we have it loaded, uh, it's, it's in the kernel. Now, how do we kind of interact with it? So I want to get into some kind of uh, uh, low level implementation details because that's what I think is, is most exciting for these kinds of talks. So 
In order to communicate back and forth between the debugger and the eBPF program, we use some pretty standard eBPF stuff, uh, ring buffers and maps. And we use them in, in what I think is some somewhat creative ways. So we use a ring buffer to communicate from eBPF land back up to user space, to the debugger. And then we use the map to communicate vital information from uh, the debugger and user space to the eBPF program. So one of the things that we communicate from user space to the eBPF program is all of the information that it needs to know to find how many arguments does this function have? Where do they live? We're talking specifically in the context of Go. Um, you may or may not be aware that uh, Go has recently changed its ABI from a stack-based calling convention to a register-based calling convention. Within Delve, we have to support both of these versions. So we have to know where to find arguments on the stack. We also have to know where to find them in, uh, in registers. And if we have pointers, we need to know how to follow them and get that data. And we need to know that it is a pointer in the first place. So we, uh, we try to convey as much of this information as possible from the debugger. And we store this information in the map that's keyed by uh, the, uh, the instruction address. So we can say, when the eBPF program is hit, it can look at what the current instruction pointer value is, look up in the map uh, the information that it needs to be able to decode all of the information, and then the, the program can kind of run and do its thing. So as you can see here, we kind of put a lot of information in, like the GoID offset, so where the GoID struct uh, uh, is from the offset of the GoID from the, the actual, like where the GoRoutine struct lives. Um, we describe the, the G adder offset, so the, the, uh, the offset of the Go routine from thread local storage. It's a lot of kind of low level information, but it's this kind of information that the debugger already has. So instead of like re-implementing a dwarf parser in eBPF or something like that, we try to provide as much context as we can from the user space side of things, and we do that ahead of time so that by the time the eBPF program is actually triggered, it has all the information that it needs to be able to just quickly, as quickly as possible, read all this information and send it back to user space. So again, more information. So for each uh, function parameter, input or output, we have a ton of information about it. What kind of variable is this? What's the size of it? What's the offset from the stack pointer if, if this is uh, stack-based um, ABI? If it's in a register, all this, all these kind of information. And then also uh, the information that we want to convey back to user space, like the values, the actual raw bytes of, of these variables. We want to pass that back to user space. So we do it through these various kind of structs that we pass around using ring buffers and maps. <clears throat> so now that we have um, all of our information set up, uh, from user space and uh, in, in the eBPF program. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how, we, how we kick all of this stuff off and how we start triggering these, these events. So from the Delve side of things, we attach U probes and U rep probes. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with this, um, through eBPF you can, you can attach uh, user space probes uh, and typically U probe would be at the function entry point and then there's also U-rep probes, which uh, can trigger whenever a function returns. So here we do uh, a thing where it's uh, update argmap, which is what I was kind of saying, where we pass all of the information from user space about how many arguments, where they're located, all of that stuff. And uh, it's keyed by um, a memory address. So uh, we say the function entry, which is where the eBPF U-probe is going to be. And we pass it all the information that it needs. And so this is us. Um, updating the eBPF map from, from Go. And then from there, we get the offset to the symbol that we want to start probing. And then we attach our probe and our U-rep probe. Now, uh, specifically with U-rep probes, when you're talking about using them with Go programs, they get a little bit tricky. So the way that U-rep probes actually work is they modify some information on the stack. So they modify actually where the function returns to. It actually ends up returning into kind of like a trampoline that ends up executing the eBPF program. This has a tendency to make Go very, very upset because Go likes to look in the mirror a lot. It likes to inspect itself. Um, so if you're not super familiar with Go, Go has this concept of Go routines, which are these very, very small kind of units of execution. And they start with really small stacks, and that stack grows and gets copied over time. So when, when Go does this, it needs to inspect the stack, look at pointers, update a bunch of stuff, 
And when it's doing the stack inspection, if it sees an address that it's not familiar with, it's gonna blow up. So we have to be really, really tricky, or we have to be really careful with how we use UREP probes specifically so that when you're tracing your program, it, just, it doesn't just start panicking because what's the point at that, <laughs> at that point, right? Um, so to do that, we, we kind of, we set a breakpoint, a real breakpoint, like a PTRAC breakpoint on, um, on the runtime function that handles this copy stack. So we kind of do this like real quick, when Go is about to copy the, the stack, we remove the UREP probes, and then when it's done, we kind of put everything back. So it's kind of like a weird little hack, but it's mostly working for us right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about getting data back from the eBPF program. So uh, libEPF Go has a really nice interface where if you're communicating back and forth using a ring buffer, on the Go side of things, you can consume it just via like a channel. So within Delve, we have a Go routine that's long running, starts communicating and, and just kind of uh, getting this information back from the eBPF program, and it can parse it. And essentially, the, the nice thing about this approach is it can, impart, it, it can start parsing it at its, at its leisure for the most part. I mean, the, the hard work is done. Like, what we really want to do is we want to we wanna prevent the program um, from stopping for too long, right? We want to prevent the overhead. So we just need to get the data in the eBPF land. We just need to gather all this data as quickly as possible, shoot it over to user space. Once it's back to user space, we can kind of parse it and present it to the user, you know, not, not slowly, but there's, there's less time constraints there because that doesn't actually affect the, the program that's being run. So this interface is really nice and it, it's been working out really great for us. Now, uh, there's, there's a lot of like upsides uh, about this, this approach and this rewrite, and it's been a lot of fun, it's been very exciting, but as with everything, there are a little bit of downsides. So one of the first things is, uh, in my opinion, eBPF programs, if, you, uh, if, you've written, if you've written them, you know. If you haven't, um, they're, they're, you mostly write them in like a constrained version of C. And when I say constrained, I mean you can't loop. You have very strict requ uh, requirements on like how much space or how much memory you can, you can allocate in the stack. There's no concept of allocating in a heap, so you have to kind of make your own heap using like a, um, a, a map or your own kind of ring buffer that you, that you just use yourself. Um, there's a lot of kind of weird non-standard stuff that you don't have to think about when you're, when you're writing in like a, a, you know, like just regular Go or even normal C or anything like that. Um, so that kind of cognitive overhead, I think, I, un, you know, I understand why it needs, it needs to be that way, but um, that is, in my opinion, just a little bit of a downside. There's, there's a little bit more that you have to think about, um, and you have to be really creative <laughs> with certain things. So, for example, like lack of, of being able to write loops in an eBPF program. From, for this particular uh, implementation, we need to be able to say, well, I want to parse three input arguments, or four, or five. How do you do that if you can't loop and, and kind of, you know, do this kind of arbitrary thing? So in our case, we kind of took advantage of uh, uh, C-style switch statements and automatic fall through to make like weird pseudo loops and stuff like that. So there is workarounds, but um, it's just something that I think people should be aware of. Another thing is kind of fighting the verifier. So it's like you're fighting a whole nother compiler. Um, so also if you're not familiar, when you, when you load uh, an eBPF program into the kernel, it goes through like a verifier where it just makes sure that um, this function or that this particular program is going to execute the way that it, it, it expects. It's not gonna do anything dangerous. It's not looping or, um, and verify that it actually will exit deterministically. I mentioned this a little bit, but the small stack requirement can be a little bit of a hindrance um, and, and something to, that you might have to work around a lot. Again, no loops, limited control flow. Um, it uh, forces you to be very creative. <laughs> and as I mentioned, UREP probes do not play, with, uh, play well with, with Go programs by default. Um, if you're not really, really careful with how you use UREP probes, you're guaranteed, pretty much guaranteed to crash any Go program that you use them with. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Derek Parker. Uh, you can find me on the Twitters there at, at Dirk the Daring. Um, and I'll be around for if anybody has any questions, comments, or anything like that. But thank you all very much.
So uh, I'll repeat the question uh, as I understand it is, um, are, are these probes handled on a, go, on a per go routine basis or are they global? So um, in, in the strictest sense, they are global. Um, but that's one of the things that we do uh, from the debugger side of things is try to figure out how to collate all of this information and present it linearly. Um, so that's one of the things, that's why it's important uh, when, when I showed some of the code examples where we're parsing the Go routine structure and we're getting the, the Go ID. So we're, we're using that information to take that back to user space and kind of present like a, a cohesive um, a story of when a function is hit and when it's returned and making sure that, that, that uh, the input and the return values are all being associated with the same the uh, context of execution, so the same Go routine. So to answer the question in general, yes, they are global, but we do uh, a little bit of work on top of it and the debugger end to kind of stitch all of those things together. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the, the question was, are there are there any limitations of um, when this this particular implementation of the backend can be used? So um, yes. So uh, right now you do have to be a privileged user to be able to load the EB, eBPF program into the kernel, um, or have uh, syscap admin. I think if you have syscap admin, you can do whatever you want. But um, uh, that that's another kind of workaround. Um, and uh, but. Um, and you, right now, it's, it's still like this, this implementation is ongoing and it's something that I'm still kind of currently working on. So right now, it's kind of, uh, you have to build like a, a uh, like we have a make file entry of like build BPF, right? Where it's like you build like a slightly different version of it. Um, so you have to do that first and then also be, yeah, a privileged user to be able to do the rest of the stuff. Great question. Um, so just to repeat the question, um, since we're talking about this in the context of production, a lot of people will strip debug information out of their production binaries to make them even smaller um, when, they, when they run them on, you know, in, in any kind of production context. So yes, this, that, that is a huge, um, for this aspect, that, that would be a huge hindrance and limitation. Um, uh, a workaround for that is Delve does allow you to supply external debug information. So if you have it stripped, but you also have it around somewhere, um, you, can, you can provide that information after the fact, even if it's not present in the binary. Delve can use that information just as it would if it was in the binary. All right, thank you, Derek. All right, thanks.